Michigan Family Wellness, episode 25. Here at Michigan Family Wellness, we believe chiropractic care and nutritional-based therapies are a foundational part of a healthy family lifestyle. No matter where you're at in the midst, having a family is such an exciting time of life. So instead of feeling overwhelmed by stress, fatigue, and responsibilities with the kids, we invite you to become part of this empowering community to create happy, healthy families. By providing engaging interviews and practical applications, Dr. Wallner cultivates family health by equipping our listeners with the tools they need to elevate wellness in their own family. Dr. Wallner passionately serves the Michigan community at his chiropractic and nutrition-based practice, where he specializes in pregnancy, pediatrics, and family wellness care. And now, here's your host, Dr. Kyle Wallner. Good day, Michigan families, and welcome to another empowering episode of Michigan Family Wellness. I am your host, Dr. Kyle, and today we have a really exciting and passionate interview with Brody Welch. But before we get to today's episode, the Michigan Family Wellness Clinic is all about helping you and your family. We're family-centered here, and when you're the single parent or the stressed-out spouse just struggling to get through each day and take care of the kids and advance your career and make sure the refrigerator is stocked with food and on and, and everything's picked up and on and on and on, we're here for you. What I help most of my patients with is resiliency, and the way I define resiliency is giving you the strength to adapt to the stress in your life. Sometimes we do have stressors that need to go, whether they be something environmental or an abusive relationship or just the nutrient-deficient food we eat. Other times, the stress isn't necessarily going away, but the way our body is adapting to that stress isn't sustainable. I help my patients, many of them women and mothers, but men, but men and fathers also increase their resiliency and equip them with the strength to adapt to the changes and the stress in their life. The saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care is absolutely true. And that's why I have committed this podcast and the MFW Clinic to service this community through integrity, certainty, and authenticity. You deserve the best doctor-patient experience, and the best results in the shortest amount of time. So if there was a way to elevate your health, your family wellness, and resiliency, would you be interested? If this message is resonating with you, or if you would like to start a conversation about your specific situation, head on over to michiganfamilywellness.com and you can email me, you can schedule a complimentary phone consultation, or you can head on over to Facebook and send me a Facebook message. All right, so let's introduce Brody before we jump into today's interview. Brody Welch is a licensed acupuncturist, board-certified herbalist, Chinese medicine expert, and self-care strategist. She's the founder of Life in Balance Acupuncture in Oregon, where she's been treating patients since 2003. In addition to her clinical practice, Brody shares her expertise to help women to take care of themselves with innovative Learn From Anywhere courses, workshops, and retreats on stress management, the body-mind connection, and Chinese medicine. She's also a creator and host of A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world. Okay, family, so Brody has a fantastic message, a wonderful passion that I really wanted to bring to you on the Michigan Family Wellness Podcast. I'm very excited to welcome her. So without any further delay, let's jump into today's interview. Welcome, families, to the interview portion of today's podcast. My guest on the show today is Brody Welch. Brody, welcome to the podcast. It's so great to have you. Thanks so much. I'm really happy to be here. You know, Brody, it really is fantastic the way technology can connect and engage people today, you know, and just getting in touch with you actually through a mutual Facebook community. I'm really amazed and ultimately grateful because here's the thing. Because of all this, now the MFW community can benefit from your experiences and unique perspective where previously that may not have been possible. So I want to thank you again for being on the show today. Oh, absolutely. I love spreading the word about Chinese medicine. So Brody, I've just told our listeners a little bit about you as the professional. Before we get into today's content, can you tell us more about you as the person and what does family look like for you? Well, let's see. Me as a person is I am a highly driven 
um, highly motivated practitioner, really always concerned with learning more of what I can to help my patients. And uh, also really concerned about walking my talk around balance and health. So I, you know, I meditate, I do yoga or qigong, I go hiking, I play music, uh, actually with my husband in a band called The Hunks and the Hottie. Oh, and fantastic. I, um, I live, um, I about let's see, four years ago, I married a widower. So I suddenly Mm -hmm. had Insta kids who were, who were at that point, um, 12 and eight and who are now, um, 17 and 13. And so I, um, I'm a full-time stepmom as well as, um, practicing in my clinic as well as developing learn from home programs for people. And so, yeah, I do, um, I have a very full life for which I am very grateful. That's awesome. Well, first of all, congratulations on uh, your family. Thanks. Yeah. And then also, I assume that in the Hunks and Hottie band, uh, you're the hottie. Is that safe to say? I am the hottie. Yeah, (laughs) they were the hunks and then I joined (laughs) when when I met my husband. But yeah, I play the cello and we all sing and we do like kind of uh, classic grass rock kind of thing. Yeah. Many of my listenership knows that um, coming up actually at the end of this month is my four-year anniversary with my wife, Rachel, and um, we have a little bit of a musical background as well. Uh, I actually play the trumpet, and my wife plays the clarinet, so if you know anything about personalities and instruments, you would never think that Uh, those two would marry each other, but, you know, here's what we got. It actually happened, so... Well, thanks a lot, Brody, for that little insight into your life there. And one more thing I like to uh, just go over real quick before we get into today's content is actually a little bit about Michigan. Now, I know you're out there in Oregon. I know you have some history from the Boston area. Do you have any insights or, you know, anything about the Great Lakes or lighthouses or anything Michigan? Well... The two things that I know about Michigan. One is that one of my closest friends from childhood went to the University of Michigan and loved it. So I I have a positive association there. And that a good friend of mine from acupuncture school uh, went out there to start his practice before there were any laws around acupuncture. So he was kind of in like the wild west of of practicing kind of in an illegal space where, uh, you know, and so and and just kind of that 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 felt... um, a little perilous and risky, but um, mm-hmm. I, I understand that you now have licensure in place in Michigan. So yeah. that's a good thing. Well, that's awesome. I mean, definitely one, being close to the U of M, being close to Ann Arbor. So we definitely appreciate that. But two, we're going to get into this in the into our interview here. But yeah, that's a major point that you brought up there with the whole uh, licensure and kind of the Wild West uh, dynamic that was out here for a while. So All right, Brody. Well, let's actually jump into some content for today. So you are a licensed acupuncturist out on the uh, Pacific Northwest out there. So explain to the Michigan Family Wellness listeners exactly what is acupuncture? Well, acupuncture is a has a 3000 plus year history of uh, basically it's a it's a complete system of medicine, acupuncture being one branch of Chinese medicine. And the practice of acupuncture is about catalyzing the body to heal itself. And we do that by making suggestions to it. And those suggestions come in the form of stimulating points on the body with these hair thin filaments that I don't even like to call needles because most people think about needles as hypodermics or, you know, getting blood drawn or shots. And and Mm -hmm. acupuncture needles are actually so small that about 40 of them can fit inside a hypodermic. So it's a very different kind of an experience. And so we're using these little filaments to tap into the body's intelligence, that electromagnetic um, current that exists that runs throughout the entire system of the body. And we use these points on the surface to affect all the different systems in the body. So we can actually affect things like, um, digestion and sleep and fertility and things that have absolutely nothing to do with physical pain, uh, because the, the internal organs of the body have these like, kind of like a keys on a keyboard that you can, you can press control, alt, delete, and get a different result than if you press control Z and you know, that, that the, um, um, you know, or, or to you, as you're a musician, you might appreciate the musical analogy of different chords mm-hmm. causing a kind of a resonance in the body. And, um, and so we combine points in different ways to send a particular message about what it is going to take to create balance in the whole person. Wow. So 
I'm actually quite impressed. I've never heard it described like that before, and I consider myself someone that's kind of been in the alternative healing uh, arena for a little while now. So um, I'm sure that our listenership is going to appreciate that. So you're actually saying, just to kind of summarize, now that we know what acupuncture is, you're saying there's actually benefits and value in terms of, you know, like, will I physically feel different when I walk out of your office compared to when I walk in? And like you mentioned digestion, you mentioned a couple of these health conditions. So you're saying, you know, by putting these, I know that they're called needles, but I know you don't, yeah, you, yeah. You don't want to call them needles, but for the right. sake of the uh, We can put that in quotation here. marks. <laughs> for the sake yes. of the, yeah, you're going to put needles in the skin and you're saying that's actually going to affect my health. Is that what you're saying? That's precisely what I'm saying. Yes. Okay. okay. So in Chinese medicine, we have, uh, if you look at the, the National Institute of Health and the World Health Organization lists out uh, dozens of different conditions that acupuncture is considered to be effective in treating. And so, and those conditions range not only from things like migraine headaches and lower back pain to, um, and I don't have the list memorized, but the things that I, that I treat in my practice have a lot to do with anxiety and depression, um, digestive concerns, insomnia, fertility, as I mentioned, high blood pressure, um, in a ver- various, um, I mean, we can help with everything from quitting smoking to weight loss to, I mean, it, there's, essentially that when you are talking to the body, you're stimulating, first of all, it's profoundly anti-inflammatory. It has an effect on all sorts of neurotransmitters, including our sort of natural endorphins and our feel-good chemicals. So it can shift us pretty much immediately from like a a stressed, tense, um, kind of fight or flight state into a parasympathetic or rest and repair mode. Um, most people leave the office and kind of, they, they, they go to, most people go to sleep on the table. It's profoundly relaxing and they leave in a state that I refer to as Aculand, which can be like just, uh, you know, people get visions and insights on the table or just come off the table feeling like they've had the best nap of their lives. And, and so it definitely does something to downshift the nervous system. Mm-hmm. And as you, as you know, most most of the conditions that we treat are made worse by stress. And so it's the kind of thing where just like if stress is a part of the picture, um, not only do I teach people how to how to work with their breath and how to work with acupoints to kind of downshift and, and get and slow their world down, but that the actual experience of acupuncture is really profoundly relaxing. And that, you know, a lot of times like if you have a chronic issue, let's say you've had, let's say you've had shoulder pain for five years. It's like your first acupuncture visit, you might feel, you, you might get some pain relief out of that first visit, but you also might not. It often takes a handful of visits for things to kind of ramp up in the body, sort of like learning to speak a language. And I know in chiropractic, there's a similar sort of, um, there's like a tipping point where, where there's, where suddenly people are like, oh yeah, this is really different than the body that I'm used to. And so mm-hmm. sometimes that, that takes a handful of visits to really, um, to really stick around. So it's definitely a process, um, but it, depending on the severity and the duration and it, you know, and a host of other factors, people often do feel that their main complaint, it changes in, in just a visit or a handful. Right, right. And I, I mean, just to add along with that, just to piggyback, you know, every case is different. So, you know, people are in different levels of health. So, you know, someone might be able to respond really quickly to your treatments or to acupuncture, whereas yeah. someone else, like you said, it might take a few yeah. sessions or yeah, um, it's also, something like that. It's also not unnecessary or not um, uncommon to have, yeah, it felt better for like a day or two, but then it came back. Well, right. that's that actually means that, that we're onto something and you need to hang in there. So I usually right. don't actually, um, you know, a responsible plan of care for Chinese medicine is a handful of visits. And then your practitioner will be able to evaluate um, just kind of like, are you almost done? Are you just getting going kind of like the, on a case by case basis? But usually a handful is enough to know whether your particular condition is the kind of thing that acupuncture can help with. Because clearly we can't like reattach a severed tendon or something mm-hmm. like that. But, right. but there's plenty that um, that we can catalyze uh, in terms of helping the body to um, to relax, to heal, to recover from a surgery or a trauma, that kind of thing, or even preventatively, if you're, you know, if you're getting kind of chronic colds and flus or chronic, you know, cr- chronic anything like that, you might not even necessarily consider a big problem. Oh yeah. Well, I, I get heartburn three times a week. It's not a big deal. Or, sure. yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I get, you know, like I just live with this. Oh yeah. Every month I have terrible, you know, menstrual cramps. It's like, yeah, that's not normal. That's not something mm-hmm. people should have right. to live with just because it's been 
is what you're used to doesn't mean that that's um, that that's something that you have to settle for. And so a lot of times um, that in Chinese medicine, we think about treating the branch as well as the root. So the, if uh, if we have one single root that is an imbalance in the body, that that can give rise to a bunch of different branches that we would consider the symptoms. And so it may be that your difficulty falling asleep at night and your poor memory and your um, weak digestion and gas and bloating all have to do with the same imbalance that we would treat and we would call that spleen sheet efficiency. You know, so like mm -hmm. a particular kind of energy in the body that needs nourishment or a particular kind of energy that needs, that we need to tamp down or regulate. And so it's this idea that um, kind of like, uh, well, Yin and yang is a, a sort of a, a concept that that is central to Chinese medicine that your listeners might be familiar with in terms of that the ubiquitous yin yang symbol. And essentially, that's the goal of Chinese medicine is to restore balance to the body and each system. So, like we could think about um, like the spleen and stomach, or the heart and small intestine, the liver gallbladder. These yin yang pairs of organs that work together to accomplish a particular job, sort of like the endocrine system. You know, like a bunch of different organs that are all doing the same thing in the body. You know, or like awesome. it's sort of each have their role to play, but it's it's not like one organ. It's scattered around, and it has a whole suite of symptoms that it could be responsible for influencing. Now, not to go off on too much of a tangent, but you know, there's acupuncture, there's dry needling. You, you mentioned <laughs> hypodermic. Yeah. Can you just kind of uh, give us, uh, you know, thirty like elevator differences and like what's what makes one the other and what makes one different from the other? Well, I'm going to reveal a bias here, but dry needling, in my opinion, is the practice of acupuncture by people like physical therapists, and chiropractors who don't want to actually get licensed to do acupuncture. You know, I see it as the kind of thing where like just because we've got, you know, Chinese in Chinese medicine, we have um we have kind of our traditional massage and traditional sort of uh, um, manipulation that I'm not going to go cracking someone's neck and call it toina, right? Yeah, clearly I remember talking about this yeah, in our pre -chat, Clearly yeah. that's chiropractic. So dry needling is essentially the insertion of needles to have a therapeutic purpose that is done that the claim is made that this is that this is done with a system that's totally different from Chinese medicine, and yet when you look at what's being taught in these seminars, the the points that are used are are most of them line right up with traditional Chinese medicine hmm, yeah. um, identified acupoints, and so uh, so I consider dry needling to be not the most responsible uh, thing in the world, and and the idea that claiming that you just invented it, you know, ten years ago, um, it is is really doing a disservice to people who really. Um, you know, to be a to be an acupuncturist, you need a four year or you know three thousand hour master's degree program, and that that that's that's kind of the the standard for licensure in most states. And so it you know there's that's there's a big difference between someone doing that versus someone who's maybe taken a weekend workshop and you know like who maybe has a medical background and knows enough anatomy to maybe not like hit like an artery or something. But mm -hmm. it, but clearly there's an art to it, and it's not just jamming a piece of metal into something. Somebody's body, so or puncturing it, it, a lung, or something yeah, like that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like the practice of acupuncture is is considered quite safe when it's done by a, a trained professional, and I don't consider dry needling to necessarily meet that threshold. So, uh, yeah. so anyway, dry needling, um, yeah, just sort of buyer beware. Uh, you know, make sure uh, make sure that your person is is super yeah. well trained. But, um, but I think that um, I think that the public is best served when we all do what we're best at. And so, you know, but finding someone who is a, a licensed acupuncturist, which in some states we're doctors of oriental medicine and other states we're acupuncture physicians, it just sort of depends on, on the state. But, um, but often licensed acupuncturist is the title and, um, and for people wanting to, to find someone near them, um, I recommend going to the, the national certification, uh, center for acupuncture and oriental medicine, which is nccaom.org. Perfect. And type in your zip code and you'll find people who are qualified to treat you. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Brody, for all of that. I, I was going to sure. get to the um, get to all those questions a little bit later on after we covered some more content. But just to just to be sure, like what you're saying is you actually have a license. You've actually passed board exams. You've gone oh, yeah. to a professional four year collegiate degree. It's not as if you just, you know, went to a weekend seminar and you know, slapped a certification on your back and now you put needles in people's skin. So right. what you're saying is like, this is a legitimate thing. And I hope people can resonate with your message and what you're saying. It's like, you actually know what you're talking about and you use this technique 
for specific therapeutic effects. So I talk a lot Absolutely. of I talk yeah. about this a lot on my podcast and with my patients. These modalities, these therapies, these techniques, they're very powerful signals for healing. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, if done incorrectly with either the wrong intent or at the wrong level, at the wrong time, you mentioned like specific points, you know, at, at the wrong point, you can actually hurt someone. And oh, absolutely. So and acupuncture, you know, it, like it's what one of the things I love about Chinese medicine is that there's so much that we can be doing on our own. It, you know, like sticking needles in ourselves is not one of those things, but we can certainly that that um, what's interesting, I think, is that that when we stimulate a point, you can do that with self massage. You could do it by anointing your skin with an essential oil. You can do it by tapping. You can, you know, like there's there's lots of different ways of talking to the body. It's not necessarily going to be the same as acupuncture um, and and especially because it were you know essentially Chinese medicine is is a whole system that that is it, it goes incredibly deep and and has um, just you know thousands of years of medical philosophy and it sort of is it's systems within systems and so obviously right. the more someone understands that kind of how it all fits together the more powerful the results can be but that shouldn't stop someone from from learning a few acupoints that could be super helpful for daily life you know I, I teach right. my patients all the time you know like here's a point for headaches and here's a right. point for you know uh, the um, to help de-stress and so it's the kind of thing where like there's definitely safe ways of applying the medicine to ourselves um, and that I think that stops short of needling. <laughs> so, yeah. So, what is a meridian? You know, years back when I was in chiropractic college, I had yeah. cadaver dissection laboratories, mm -hmm. and when I metaphorically speaking opened up the hood yeah. on the human body, I didn't necessarily yeah. see a bunch of lines crossing the elbow or going up and down the spine or, you know, around, you know, these charts that I've seen or that people right. may have seen before. So yeah. explain that for our listenership. Is it like there are yeah. these lines on everyone's body that, or, you know, tell us what that's like. Sure. Well, so, so let me back up a little bit and just to, so, because basically it, that one of the central notions in Chinese medicine is that the whole body is is this field of energy, which is something that is borne out in science, right? We can measure that there's a field of energy that projects past the human form six to 12 inches. And that, and if we think about, if we shift our paradigm from kind of the Newtonian physics model of like, we're a bunch of mechanistic um, parts bouncing around that, you know, like, to, and we shift over to the, the quantum or Einstein, you know, physics dimension, we're mainly empty space with just tiny little bits of matter. You know, if we de identify our, with a, uh, with ourselves as kind of the energy of who we are, if like we think about that, basically um, we're we're a field of energy with some with some mass. Uh, the energy is going to be the vast majority of that, and so the acupuncture meridians are kind of like the main channels of how energy primarily circulates through the body, um, as identified in Chinese medicine. And just like if you cut open a phone line, you wouldn't see the electricity running through it, um, you know, or like in in cadaver lab. Um, um, you know, like w one of the first things that happens is you cut away the fascia, right? You, like, you mm -hmm. cut away that that superficial connective tissue. And that's usually where the meridians are said to run. It's actually in the fascia. And I, th I think it's actually really exciting, the research that's currently being done into kind of like um, just how much, how fascia isn't just this inert tissue, but it allows for communication, um, you know, on a cellular level with uh, the nervous system, with the brain, you know, kind of all this that we used to, to not know about it. Exactly. And so, so it's kind of like, yeah, that and any time like we didn't used to think that the cranial bones moved because all of the, you know, that and now we know that there is this, such a thing as the craniosacral rhythm, which is created by the movement of cerebral spinal fluid within the dura, within that deep you know level of the spine. And that and that it's actually really vital to <laughs> that that's flowing well in order for all systems of the body to feel um, relaxed and balanced. And so similarly with Chinese medicine, if you were to cut into a, a cadaver, you would not see the meridians because there's no life, you know, like that. that that, like there is no bioelectricity because the person isn't alive you know so it's the kind of thing where like in a living body there absolutely are ways that that energy moves around that can be regulated and each of the you know so the the there are hundreds of points and those points are correct are connected to one another on these on these rivers of energy or these lines or the electrical lines that we think of as meridians and so um 
so we can use basically a point is where these body's energy can be accessed and energy travels on the on the meridian to the internal organs which is one of the reasons why we can do things like regulate stomach acid using stomach 36 which is on the lower leg mm -hmm. you know that point will either increase or decrease stomach acid depending yeah. on what the person needs because the stomach channel goes through the stomach so it's kind of like you know what highway are you going to take in order to get to the organ system that you want to to affect Fantastic. So let me describe a framework for you here, and uh, I think my patients will appreciate this as well, and the people listening, the families listening will appreciate this as well. Um, a patient comes to me because their back hurts. Obviously, being a chiropractor, their back hurts, you know, they come to me. Uh, after I performed a thorough health history, I also find out that this person uh, has been diagnosed with high blood pressure, okay? And they also have a history of chronic kidney-related disease, okay? So I'm trying to set up the context for this acupuncture connection that I'm about to yeah. describe here. So we all know that the kidneys, through uh, you know, just our understanding of physiology, the kidneys actually help regulate blood pressure, okay? So naturally, being a doctor and having a blood pressure cuff, I pull out my blood pressure cuff and I actually take this person's blood pressure reading, okay? So it was high, you know, systolic was in the 160s, okay? So if you look at the kidney meridian, if you pull out your acupuncture charts or if you've ever looked at an acupuncture meridian chart, you know, you'll find that there is actually a kidney meridian and it goes all the way from the bottom of the foot to basically the heads of the clavicles, okay? What I do is actually I start evaluating this patient's foot, okay, the actual joints in the foot because what happens is these meridians, they cross joint lines. And while as a chiropractor, I'm not going to put a needle in someone's skin, but I am licensed and it is within my scope to actually evaluate the range of motion, the joint restriction of, you know, everything from the spine all the way down to the extremities. So I'm checking out this guy's foot. And what I'm finding is that there is major joint restriction actually in the longitudinal arch or actually where the navicular bone is. And when I looked at the kidney meridian, I saw that it kind of crossed uh, right on that longitudinal arch there. What I do next is actually, you know, because his chief complaint is low back pain. So he's like, Doc, what are you doing with my foot? I'm coming to you from my back. You know, what's, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. So then I actually start testing using a technique called applied kinesiology or muscle testing. And I actually, and my patients are familiar with this as well. So I'm actually challenging the psoas muscle or his hip flexor. And I'm finding that this guy cannot hold his hip flexor. He has the weakest hip flexor. His psoas is just completely what I would describe as neurologically inhibited. Okay. And so guess what muscle relates to the kidney meridian? and it's the psoas. So I hope this is starting to all kind of make sense here, but what I want to describe is after I adjusted this patient's foot, okay, so I corrected the dropped navicular bone, all right, that reestablished the flow or the chi or the prana of the kidney meridian, which then restored strength to his psoas muscle, which took away his low back pain. So that was his immediate experience. He was like, Doc, you just adjusted my foot. That helps my back. Mm -hmm. and, that, and to me, that was amazing. That was huge. And then you know what we did next? We actually retook that blood pressure uh, reading, and we found that the systolic had come down to within that normal range. Yeah. Okay, All because I, the, the kidney meridian was dysfunctional or imbalanced, as you would describe. Yeah, I think that's a that's an awesome example. Um, it, it, can I can I add on to what you just Absolutely. said? Absolutely, go ahead. Yeah. Man. So a couple things strike me in that description, and and one is that kind of many paths to the same point thing is is really you know that that yeah a lot of times that one of the one of the points on the kidney meridian near the navicular bone is going to be kidney two, and that so different points on the kidney meridian like what you what you the points that you choose have different jobs. And so in Chinese medicine, it's it's like, yes, there's meridian therapy, which is kind of using points on the same channel to affect a different part of the body that's on the channel, which is what you're describing in your example here, using the ankle to affect, you know, um, the back and, and that incidentally the blood pressure dropped. But in Chinese medicine, the kidney system is part of what we call the water element. And so it is in charge of like, it, so it rules 
um, basically the lower body. It rules the lower back. It rules the bones and joints in general. It's, you know, so just some, anyone dealing with arthritis, you know, like, like we, we definitely would think kidney. Um, kidney connects with the emotion of fear. Um, kidneys, that the main job of water, one of the main jobs of the water element is to regulate the fire element, which is where the heart lives, you know. So basically it's yin and yang. Right? Basically, mm -hmm. if, if, the, if there's too weak um, in the water element, then, then the fire can go out of control and you get something like high blood pressure. And so it, my guess is that by manipulating or, you know, what working with kidney two and, you know, either but with adjusting it or, um, you know, adjusting the navicular bone or putting a needle at, at kidney two, that we're sending a message to the body of like, hey, let's take this excess heat that let's, um, let's sort of like clear what we would call empty heat in Chinese medicine so that, um, so that the blood pressure goes down and also so that everything that it, that the kidney meridian um, connects with, including the psoas, can can come back into balance. And so it's like, yes, there is this meridian therapy idea, but there's also this five element idea of kind of how how energy moves um, inside, internally, among the different organ systems, and how we would use how everything's all connected. And so the fact that kidney is, you know, allopathic medicine has identified the kidneys as playing a major role in blood pressure regulation and in Chinese medicine, yeah, lo and behold, that's, that is exactly the logic there too. And so in addition to kidney points, I might also choose some points that take down the blood pressure empirically or that clear heat from the heart if indeed that was the problem, like based on the assessment tools that we use in Chinese medicine, which include taking the pulse at the radial artery at three different positions at three different depths by looking at the person's tongue and by asking a ton of questions that we affectionately refer to as the 10,000 questions. Awesome, and, uh, Brody. Well, it's yeah. exactly this kind of alternative thinking, but at the same time, based in science, this functional approach, and in, including your acupuncture practice as well, that can be so valuable and provide so much significance uh, for so many people. And Honestly, and I'm sure you, I'm sure you see this out in the Pacific Northwest as well. It can actually save you thousands of dollars on needless medical and emergency care. We still need all that. Um, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but it can save you, you know, tons of resources on that emergency care when you can just, you know, have this preventative, this alternative, um, you know, approach to your health and wellness lifestyle. And honestly, too, you know, it can save you from the detrimental side effects from many of the medications. You know, it's like you you go, you get a medication for a symptom or a chief complaint, and then you have the side effects of that medication, which then you need more medications for. So I'm just uh, really appreciating the value and uh, kind of, the again, that different mindset, that different kind of alternative thinking that I think people are really benefiting from in terms of, you know, acupuncture, meridians, which brings me to traditional Chinese medicine. So I know that in our pre-chat, you were describing how, you know, there's acupuncture, there's qigong, and it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, is traditional Chinese medicine or TCM, is that kind of the major umbrella or the major tree? And then there's all these different branches that include acupuncture and qigong. Is that how it works? Yeah. So Chinese medicine would be the umbrella term. Traditional Chinese medicine is actually the name of one particular branch within the the bigger umbrella of Chinese medicine. Okay. Okay. TCM was codified by Mao um, in an attempt to, uh, you know, under communist China to, in order to kind of like regulate the practice of acupuncture and make it easier to teach to the masses. And so kind of like it is one particular way where like, okay, you know, there's, if somebody comes in with a headache, okay, these are the 10 different kinds of headaches that we're going to recognize in these systems and for these for these you know you use these points for this kind of headache depending on on the differential diagnosis that is also that but that's sort of like that's one way of practicing Chinese medicine um, there's also classical Chinese medicine and there's sort of there's I mean obviously uh, Chinese medicine has been around for 3,000 years. It hasn't just been in China. There's been different systems that have evolved in Japan and Vietnam and, you know, kind of all throughout Asia. Mm -hmm. um, and then before spreading to the West within the past, you know, 50, 100 years, that kind of thing. Uh, but in any case, Chinese medicine in general is is a, a 
a complete system of healthcare with its own system of diagnostics and treatment. Acupuncture is one branch. Um, our, our most, our, I think our, our second most important branch is going to be herbal medicine. So just as like whatever we identify as a primary imbalance in the body, we could generally speaking for, for pain issues, acupuncture is going to be the, probably the most effective tool. But for most of our internal medicine imbalances, like basically anything else that you would see a physician for, um, that, that, herbal medicine could be the most powerful intervention. And so we we look at kind of, again, what's out of balance in the body, what kind of energy needs strengthening, what kind of energy needs dispersing, what's going on with the ecosystem that is this person. And then we would prescribe a formula of uh, usually a mixture of different herbs. So instead of like kind of in the West, we're, we're used to saying like, oh, well, if you have sleep problems, take you know, valerian root, or if you have mm-hmm. low, weak immunity, take um, echinacea. But in Chinese medicine, it's more like instead of like giving somebody like a bag of flour and a bag of baking soda and a bag of sugar, it's more like here, have this cake mix, you know, like here, right. have this like synergistic combines um, herbs that are designed to do a particular job in the body of regulating balance. So, so herbal medicine is another important branch. Um, other branches include diet. Obviously, that's a major point of, of any kind of medicine, but mm-hmm. that's con- considered a, a branch in and of itself of Chinese medicine. So, instead of um, how that might differ, how that might differ from the way that we think about diet in the West is like we're used to thinking about carbs, protein, fat, vitamins, and minerals. And in Chinese medicine, we look at things like the temperature and the taste of food. So kind of, is this warming or cooling? And, you know, and what, and the, the idea that each taste has a particular function in the body. So if somebody's having difficulty losing weight or they have terrible digestion, um, we're gonna look at the energetics of the foods that they're eating and the the balance of taste. And also each food is considered medicine for a particular system of the body, right? We know that, mm-hmm. that you know, that, that that's true, right? That based on the, the kinds of nutrients that, that go towards making a particular system healthy, we have that same notion in Chinese medicine. So there's a lot to the diet theory. And it's a lot more kind of on the energetics of food than it is on, um, it's just, anyway, it can be a new spin on um, how we think about what we're putting into our bodies. Another branch is going to be exercise. And that's different than kind of what we think of as like pumping iron or going for a run. You know, it's like, yes, that's exercise. But in Chinese medicine, exercise means basically uh, breathing and moving and breathing life into the body through practices like Qigong or Tai Chi. Um, Tai Chi basically is it was probably more familiar to most people. It's a little bit more uh, popular and famous. But Qigong just means energy exercise or kind of a way of cultivating and building your own internal energy. And it's sort of like a moving meditation, like, um, you know, or kind of like Taoist yoga. So if people are familiar with, with, um, yoga that basically you're, you're breathing, you're combining your breath and your intention and a posture and Qigong does the same thing, except that it's a, it's a bit less linear and a little more flowy. Um, and for a lot of people much more accessible because it's sort of, um, it's pretty accessible to all bodies and can be, can be modified with the mind. And so, um, so Qigong I love because it's sort of like a moving meditation or a gentle exercise exercise all in one. And so that's one of the reasons that I, I really um, feel like that's a, a particularly useful branch of the medicine that people can can take on um, as a self-care practice. And so and some people would even include meditation um, as a branch of Chinese medicine as well. Would Tai Chi be a branch or is that in yeah, a different... Well, Tai Chi would be a kind of a subset of Qigong. Okay. So, so Qigong means energy exercise. Tai Chi is basically like, so you you can cultivate energy for the purposes of self-healing. You can cultivate it as a spiritual practice, or you can cultivate it kind of as a martial art. And Tai Chi is kind of like martial arts in slow motion. You know, it's, it's yeah. sort of, obviously it has yeah. health benefits, but the, um, it, it's, it's sort of like, yeah, it's, it's going to be a branch on the Qigong tree. Kind of circling back to what you were saying earlier with just helping people balance their sympathetic and their parasympathetic, I find that my patients who actually practice Tai Chi, you know, because you're moving so slowly, it not only slows down the movements of your joints and your muscles, but also benefits you by slowing down your mind. And like you were saying earlier, you know, really trying to balance that parasympathetic nervous system with that sympathetic nervous system. So I yeah. appreciate your clarification there with the, uh, you know, the, the tree of Chinese medicine and how there are all these different branches, you know, 
TCM or the traditional Chinese medicine being a branch in and of itself. I find that yeah. fascinating. So yeah, it's definitely you know, and and it's like I I don't necessarily take offense. Like people can people can say that I practice TCM, but it's I I also I, I very much recognize that that it's like that in and of itself is a, is an evolution that's built on thousands of years of what came before it. And right. so like it's and in some senses, like at what was lost and in sort of like China's attempt to be appealing to kind of like the evidence based you know allopathic uh, medicine establishment of the West is that what was lost was this idea of the body, mind, spirit connection, which I think is one of Chinese medicine's real strengths, you know, like mm -hmm. that, that the idea that our thoughts affect our physiology and everything from that, how we digest our food to like every state of the nervous system is every is represented by a state in the immune system and, and every like the emotions and the thoughts have an effect on on virtually every system of the body so and the fact that in Chinese medicine each organ system correlates with an emotion and with a particular dimension of our um, of our consciousness so for example the spleen is connected with our ability to focus our intention right. and our liver is connected with our imagination you know like and and that that idea so if someone's feeling blocked or stuck or like they're you know they're angry all the time it's like well we need to move the liver chi or that you yeah. know or the liver the liver is getting too hot and that absolutely we can think about the energetics of well what what is the what are the chemicals that might be heating up the liver that the mm -hmm. person needs to be doing less of you know is there are there dietary things that could have an effect on that there are certainly points or, you know, and as well mm -hmm. as herbs that can do it too. But looking at, um, at being able to, to think about that really, uh, getting a handle on how we feel and how we think has a huge effect on, on our physiology. You mentioned the spleen and I know that, yeah. you know, you talked about like focusing and like trying to do, so multitaskers are who I usually yeah. see with like a, I don't know if you'd call it a spleen deficiency or an imbalance, but I'm sure you see a lot of that, especially with our, you know, our mobile devices, you know, having 10 million apps open at once, you know, trying to just do everything while driving. You know, it seems like we're just uh, sure. we're just uh, burning away our nervous system and our uh, ch our spleen chi that way. So. Well, awesome. Now, Brody, I know that we've mentioned things kind of throughout the interview today, but let's talk practical applications. Do you have like top uh, a top three or a top two or just a few self-care techniques that you would recommend for the listeners? Well, one of the first things that I recommend to my patients is to slow down their world by slowing down their breath. You know, so like, as, as you're saying, yes, we live in a world where we're, we're our attention is being pulled in a million different directions. And so one of the most important things I see for self-care is is for people to have a relationship where they're, where they're at least checking in with their breath. So just as people make, you know, usually time each day to eat food, that I recommend that people set a little gentle timer on their phone and have a few times a day where they come back to their breath. And actually on my website, I have a free breathing meditation that walks you through kind of just how to do that and to, to just kind of get a handle on being able to use your breath as an assessment tool for what's going on in your body. So that's absolutely like the first thing because uh, because we, we live in, a, in, in Chinese medicine terms, we live in a yang addicted world, right? So if yang is like the active and moving and productive and hot kind of energy, it's like we've got way too much of that as a culture. And the idea that like yin and yang support each other. So what supports that is actually dropping into yin, dropping into a state of relaxation and rest and peace and slowness and that that actually enables us to be more productive and and rock our mission in the world but um but in, unless we are um unless we're giving time to things like oh i don't know sleep um mm -hmm. time you know time alone is another big one i work with a lot of women who overwork and overserve and so that's that's actually sort of my second big uh, encouragement in terms of self care is looking at do your does your schedule match your priorities, you know, and really doing that values check in That's a great and, point. Yeah. and, and because a lot of people, you know, it's like, if you ask them what's important to them, it's, it's not necessarily the thing that gets the juice. And a lot of people, women especially are conditioned to take care of everyone else's needs before themselves. And the idea of taking time to either make themselves the healthy food or get the exercise that they want or whatever, it's like, it's that, that somehow feels selfish. And so, so number two, you know, is going to be self-care is not selfish and actually going, get, you know, honoring your yin, honoring your body, slowing down, um, having a body mind practice. These are the kinds of things that allow you to show up with love and presence for the people in your life and the people that you do want to serve. 
and I know that like I struggle with that myself. And so I, I say that not with, um, not from a place of I've got it all figured out, but I, but I just know it to be true time and time again, that when I make time to, to, to feed my soul and to do, you know, what fills me up and to connect in love in however that may be for someone, whether that's taking a walk in nature or whether that's prayer or meditation or, um, you know, good, quality time with a friend, you know, like that, that making sure that that happens just as much as the checking stuff off the to-do list and the, and the hard work and the, you know, cleaning the bathroom. Awesome. So what I'm hearing you say is, you know, having this uh, connection back to breath, you know, setting timers on your phone uh, throughout the day, really, I mean, to get just connected back to that slow parasympathetic breath, realizing that it's, you know, not selfish to actually have self care. I love the way you said that, too. Um, Would there be any kind of points that you would recommend? Or are these just so medicinal and so therapeutic that you really want someone to actually, you know, do a formal assessment and then actually recommend uh, specific points for that specific case? Or if I have headaches, Uh, like, is there anything I can do for my headaches, you know, as a result? Yeah. I mean, so that gets into like to specific conditions a little bit and, and usually requires a, a deeper dive. But mm-hmm. but some of my favorite points for stress, for example, um, there's a point in the center of the face, um, but just between the eyebrows um, called Yin Tong. And that's one of the points where just even just tapping lightly or just pressing lightly with an index finger or resting a little stone there or, you know, like or, or even anointing it with a little lavender essential oil, mm-hmm. not too close to the eyes, obviously, but um, but you know, like just just um, laying your hand on that point to give the body a subtle reminder that you're that it can slow down. Um, that can be that could be a really really simple way. Um, uh, another point that I really love is the it is called Shen Men. It's in the upper corner of the ear, um, so kind of in that little triangle in the upper part of the ear. That um, pressing on that point, that's another wonderful calm the mind point. So th- those are just two that I might pick out out of you know dozens that I could choose. But those are the typically um, typically ones that just sometimes j- well just massaging that ear point or just that light fingertip pressure on the center of the forehead head, that those can often, um, you know, just try it out, see what that does for Mm -hmm. you, because you might be able to feel that that has an immediate effect. Um, If people are nervous about getting a treatment, a lot of times I'll put an essential oil on that, um, that ear point and people will just, you just watch the tension just melt out of someone's body. Um, So, but yeah, I have a lot of self-care tips and um, more particular self-care strategies based in Chinese medicine on my website at Mm brodywelch.com. And so um, people can, you know, I also have a podcast, but um, but definitely um, there's certainly resources uh, for people who are interested in learning more specific points and specific kind of ways of aligning with the rhythms of nature. That's the kind of thing that, um, or learning some Qigong for that matter. um, That's all the, the kinds of things that I love helping people with. And just to clarify, too, you know, I'm all about self-experimentation and, you know, trying things on uh, your own. But I do want to be clear, too, and correct me if I'm wrong. What what you're not saying is to go grab, you know, your sewing needle at home if you're listening to this <laughs> yeah, and so start putting it, that. you know, right in between <laughs> your uh, your forehead, right between your eyebrows there or tapping that point you mentioned on your ear. So you're not saying that, correct? Like oh, it's no, a different no, no. kind I, of needle, right? I am saying that no one should be needling themselves. Like, okay. let's just let's just be really clear about that. What I'm yeah. what I mean is is working with the points, um, you know, either with gentle pressure or with intention, uh, you know, or that uh, just st- stimulating it with your with your hands or you know or anointing it with an oil. So that's that's about as far. You know, as it, it may sound silly that I bring it up, you know, but yeah. I just like to clarify for people because sometimes you know I work with nutrition in my practice and I'll give someone a supplement and they're like, okay, and I'll, I'll say take this this two times a day or something. Yeah. And obviously I'm implying like I want you to, you know, use a glass of water and swallow it, you know, have <laughs> it go through your digestive tract. Some people they're like should I put this in my ear? Like, do yeah, I chew this? Yeah, like, what do yeah, I do with this? Point. And I'm like, okay, this is exactly what I want you to do. So I'm just, Never I like to clarify. Explicit. Yes. Exactly. So I appreciate that. So Brody, you kind of got into it. You kind of mentioned it, but so definitely, uh, you know, I always like to ask about additional resources that you would recommend for people to elevate their family wellness. And you already mentioned that you have this, uh, breathing uh, tutorial or this breathing framework that people can access uh, at your website. Well, just go ahead and tell people where they can find more about you. I am at BrodyWelch.com. So that's 
Brody with an IE and Welch with a CH and that and under the learn from home tabs those are for people who want like a deep dive but on virtually any page of my website um, you'll be invited to um, to download your free breathing meditation I also have a little qigong thing up there and I have uh, like the the blog archives has all kinds of information about how to eat in alignment with the seasons and different acupoints um, I have several articles on the Huffington Post about particular acupoints for particular emotional conditions and um, as well as on qigong so people can search for me there. Um, there's also links from my website and and my podcast. For and then the podcast, yes. Yeah, it's called A Healthy Curiosity, and it's you can subscribe for free in iTunes. And that is where people will find information from not only Chinese medicine. I mean, I have experts within my field talking about the different uh, think you know things like getting over needle phobia or the different yeah. conditions that people might be faced with, but also um, conversations with people who are trying to be well in a busy world and the strategies that are working for them and not. So uh, conversations with experts, but also with with people who are experts by virtue of the fact that they've been that they've learned something that they have some wisdom to offer, and so um, a lot of personal stories um, available there. Fantastic. And remember, families, we're going to have a dedicated webpage with all of the show notes that we've mentioned here at michiganfamilywellness.com. Also, you can expand those show notes right on your mobile device, and you can take advantage of those clickable links right now. Brody, you're a wife, you're a mother, you're an acupuncturist, you're this amazing health coach. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You're a fellow podcaster. I love that. <laughs> And I just want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Well, thank you, Kyle. It's been a pleasure. And remember, we can do far more together than we could ever do apart. Coming to you from beautiful Southeast Michigan, I'm your host, Dr. Kyle, and this is Michigan Family Wellness. Now that you've been equipped with the latest in family wellness solutions, we want to encourage you to apply these strategies right away. But the thing is, there's still so much to learn. Connect with Dr. Walner's chiropractic and nutrition office by going to michiganfamilywellness.com and click the newsletter sign-up button to join the informative and supportive community of chiropractic wellness. You will also receive as a gift from Dr. Walner a copy of Michigan Family Wellness Solutions, an invaluable resource containing dynamic tools to elevate family health and vitality. Michigan Family Wellness wants to thank you for being part of today's podcast. Please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and give us a five-star rating and review. 